Coming up on The Reveal, exceptional clearance. It kind of gives a false illusion that we're doing a better job of solving these cases than we really are. How a provision in the law aimed helping solve crimes is leaving suspected rapists on the streets. <laughs> then, keeping Jalen. Like right now, we don't have a couch. <laughs> like, literally, we do not have a couch right the now. The couch that was there. It's I mean, gone. It's gone. Why so many parents are left making heartbreaking decisions just to help care for their kids. Plus, the city of Buckhead. So many things account for why you have crime at any given time, in particular types of crime. What's behind the movement to separate and how we could change the course of crime. From our Midtown studios in Atlanta, the reveal begins now with our multi-Emmy and National Mural Award-winning team of investigators. Welcome to The Reveal, I'm Kristen Crowley. Exceptional clearance is a special tool for law enforcement agencies to close cases without making an arrest. It's intended to be used when a suspect is already serving time for another crime or the suspect dies. But as we discovered, that's not always the case. No. Did you ever ask her? No. Did you ever hear a yes? No, because you weren't listening to her at all, were you? It all looks so simple on TV. An accused rapist gets arrested, goes to court, guilty, and ends up in prison. If only real life were that simple. You know, I thought it was going to be quick, especially with video evidence and seeing his face and knowing it's my body. Despite this graphic video, this woman, whose identity we're protecting, says she couldn't get Cherokee Sheriff's detectives to even question her alleged rapist in the six years since she reported the alleged crime. The sheriff's office telling Eleven Alive it doesn't have enough evidence to make an arrest. I would say either you know 50 to 75 percent are not taking a survivor seriously. Jennifer Bivens is president and CEO of Ganesa, the Georgia network to end sexual assault. She says while as many as 98 percent of rape reports are legitimate, a small fraction ever result in an arrest. And is that common? Is this happening? Yes. Yes. She's not alone. Yes. No, no, she's not alone. We took a closer look at rape reports in Cherokee County, and here's what we found. From 2015 to 2020, the sheriff's office investigated 220 rapes. It cleared 171 of them. That's a 78% clearance rate. It sounds good, but it's misleading because we uncovered it only arrested 36 suspects, 16%. So what happened to the other 62%? A majority of the cases, 39% of them, were ruled unfounded, and 20% were closed, citing something called exceptional clearance. It kind of gives a false illusion that we're doing a better job of solving these cases than we really are. Georgia State criminology professor and former Memphis police officer Thaddeus Johnson says exceptional clearance is meant to close a case when circumstances beyond an officer's control prevent the arrest of a known suspect. For example, if the suspect has died, left the country, or is already in custody for another crime in another jurisdiction. In policing and police leadership, what we care about are numbers. So we care about public safety, don't get me wrong. But at that level, it's about numbers because funding goes along with it, credibility goes along with it. The session of clearance allows prosecutors and departments uh, to be able to satisfy those statistical or those numbers without being held accountable to follow all the way through with the investigation. How often should exceptional clearance be used? Is this something that would be considered a rare tool for police? It should be. But it's not. In Cherokee County's case, it's clearing more rape cases with exceptional clearances than arrests. That means more often than not, people who are suspects in a rape case are walking free. And our investigation uncovered Cherokee County isn't alone. We sent open records requests to half a dozen police departments. Cobb County Police exceptionally cleared 28% of all rape cases. Their arrest rate, 16%. Atlanta Police clears more rapes with arrests than with exceptional clearance but it still cleared 20% of all of its rape cases exceptionally over the last six years. That means more than 200 known suspects were never arrested or charged with the crime. 
Forsyth had the lowest number of exceptional clearances, only two over a four-year period. But out of 70 rape cases, it says 48 are unsolved and inactive. I guess if you're a rapist, you come on to Georgia because, um, you know, we're not prosecuting folks here, is what that says to me. And that is scary for our community. We asked these departments for the reasons these known suspects were never arrested or charged. Cherokee County was the only one that provided that data, saying in most cases it's because the victim wouldn't cooperate. Atlanta PD says it usually exceptionally clears rape cases for the same reason, but it doesn't keep an official record. We shouldn't make that the scapegoat for reasons why we use exceptional clearance. The other departments couldn't tell us why they're exceptionally clearing rapes because they're not keeping track. That should be tracked. There should be clear statements as to why they're making these recommendations and especially if their decision is not to move forward with the case. State Representative Scott Holcomb sponsored the Sexual Assault Reform Act of 2021, a law that he says is supposed to do more for survivors by tracking rape kits and making sure police departments are following through with investigations. But he says full justice for rape survivors is still a ways away. We have to start prosecuting more cases and getting more convictions. From my perspective, the rates of prosecution are too low. Um, that's true across the country and that's true here in Georgia. What, six years late, it still doesn't matter. For this woman, she's not sure the man seen on camera allegedly assaulting her will ever see the inside of a courtroom. But she hopes her case avoids becoming yet another exception. We asked a total of six departments for their exceptional clearance records on rapes. The one department we did not receive data for was Gwinnett County. Officials told us they don't have those records on hand and tracking them down would cost us $1,300. A mother's agony. He gets up like one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes he screams. Sometimes he tries to open my door and just kind of get my attention. Why Georgia is seeing more parents abandoning their kids and what can help keep more families together. Abandoned sounds like a harsh term for a heartbreaking situation. And until you've spent time with these families, it's hard to understand. But as part of our effort to expose the gaps that lead parents to even consider the option, one mom invited me to hang out for a day to watch just what's involved in keeping Jalen. <laughs> It was 8 a.m. when I arrived with a bag full of cameras. Now, where do you generally sit to capture a typical day in Jalen's life? Great job. His mom wanted us to see firsthand what's involved in raising a nonverbal child with autism. <laughs> a lot of jumping, breaking of furniture. His actions may not make sense to you. He doesn't like clothes. His movements are often abrupt and he can be loud. He gets up like one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes he screams. Sometimes he tries to open my door and just kind of get my attention. Well, Maria wants more for her son. She remembers a few years back when he started to intentionally physically injure himself. There was no way as a single working mom, she could watch him 24 hours a day. I said, if you guys don't help him, I'm at the part right now where he's just gonna get dropped off at Children's. And I meant it. Did I want to do it? No. I felt like it was the only way I could get some help for him. Dropped off means abandoned. To force the state to pay attention to their needs. Even after you made that desperate call for help? Yeah. Did you get it? No. This is a good time to talk about EPSDT. And that stands for Early Periodic Screening, Diagnostic and Treatment. It's a lot of words, but children like Jalen really need us to understand them. Because at its core, EPSDT means kids are entitled to whatever Medicaid service 
they need that's medically necessary. Medically necessary. Remember that term because we're going to come back to that in a moment. It's not enough to say give a list of providers with some phone numbers, call 50 and see what you get. Yet Maria says that is exactly what she has experienced. Does that mean we're breaking the law? The state of Georgia? I believe it does. And who's accountable for that? So the state Medicaid agency is the Department of Community Health. <laughs> the problem, there are really no consequences when states fail to meet the needs outside of a lawsuit. Children with more complicated diagnoses or multiple diagnoses fall in what I call the Grand Canyon of service gaps. The state knows needs are not being met. It is a state agency that wrote this nine page memo outlining some of the problems. And in the past two years, child advocates, attorneys and behavioral health providers have also written letters to DCH listing specific steps that could help calling the current system incoherent. I think human instinct sometimes has us when someone suggests a new bold idea to go, ah, is that possible? Can Erica fenner sitkoff is the executive director of Voices for Georgia's Children. We advance laws, policies, and actions that improve the lives of children. Right now, Voices is studying denials. Why families with high need children on Medicaid are being told no. Remember EPSDT and that mandate to provide what's medically necessary? As much as we have definitions for what's medically necessary, there is a human component to this. There are people deciding that. Fenner Sitkoff says that means who wow. gets what is often inconsistent. Whether those denials are by private insurance or Medicaid, it's often the taxpayers that foot the bill. Defect says it spent more than $72 million to pick up the tab on treatments that had been denied. Now, not all of those children had been abandoned, but they do represent the same group. Duly diagnosed teenagers with severe mental health and developmental disabilities. The sad part about this is if I die tomorrow, he's gonna get help because I'm dead. Jay? Parents like Maria say the research needs to go even further to make sure children that do qualify for services actually get that. <laughs> Once approved, she tried to get Jalen behavioral therapy to help him find better ways to communicate, but she couldn't juggle the appointments with her job. Now that she's working from home, therapists say at 17, he's too old. And <laughs> that really broke my heart because. <sighs> Do you feel like if you could have gotten him into some of these things yes. sooner? Yes. I there do. was always a barrier. There was always a barrier. <laughs> Simple habits like rocking and jumping have destroyed several beds. <laughs> The stair rail is busted and this couch. <laughs> like right now we don't have a couch. <laughs> like literally we do not have a couch right the now. The couch that was there. When it's I was gone. There, it's gone. Gone, not from one jump, but a repetition of little jumps each day, every day. A pattern of walking in and out of rooms, turning on and off the lights, <laughs> disrupted sleep and desperate attempts to be understood. Without resources to break the cycle, Jalen and his mom will live trapped in this loop. I love my son. I love him so much, but it's like, am I the best thing for him? Some days I don't feel that way. Like, he's, I mean, what is he learning from me? How am I helping him? Like, what can I do? Like, I feel helpless. Like, I'm his advocate and I feel helpless. It's not that Georgia doesn't care. 22% of our state funding goes towards some type of health care program, according to the Budget and Policy Institute. But families say we either need to spend more or spend differently. To watch our entire series, go to the Investigations tab on our website, 11alive.com.
Is violent crime really spiking? The Atlanta Police Department is completely demoralized. The minimum for a short period of time in Buckhead City would be 250 police officers. How cities breaking off impacted crime around Atlanta and what it can mean for Buckhead. Welcome back. I'm reporter Liza Lucas. The push to make Buckhead its own city is growing stronger. Supporters say separating from the city of Atlanta and forming their own city and police department is what it will take to drive away crime. The plan has to cross legislative hurdles before moving forward, but the idea is already raising questions. Is a new city the best solution? Good job. Come on. During the day, Casey Santorelli has no problem walking her dogs outside her home. Good girl. At night, that's a different story. I will walk them right outside my apartment and then I'll run right back in because I don't feel safe walking around. Just over a year ago, Casey escaped pandemic lockdown in New York City for a new start in Buckhead, only to find herself stuck in another sort of confinement. So this building, there was actually a shooting on 4th of July. Yeah, it's been pretty bad. <laughs> Everyone told me Buckhead was great and it was the place to move in Atlanta. Police are investigating the shooting death of a man in Buckhead. Slowly, the crime started to get really bad. I will not go out past 9 o'clock every night. Casey now considering moving again. Others living on her corner also planning to move. It's unnerving. It's scary. Uh, it's definitely, you know, not the Buckhead that, that I remember uh, when I moved to Atlanta 17 years ago. Bill White is CEO and chairman of Buckhead City Committee, the group pushing to create its own city, frustrated with what they say is a lack of leadership and a spike in crime. One of the reasons we believe that crime is very high in Buckhead, there is a lack of love and appreciation for our police. The Atlanta Police Department is completely demoralized. White says a Buckhead city would bolster its own police force and tackle crime through increased officer presence. The minimum for a short period of time in Buckhead city would be 250 police officers. So you're going to see a police officer at every major place. But Atlanta's mayor and opposition groups are pushing back, as is criminologist Volkan Topali, who recently became a crime victim himself now scarred from the surgery needed to remove a bullet from his arm. I was uh, one of the three people that were shot at the Home Depot and Lindbergh Station parking lot a couple months ago, um, and it was truly the wrong place at the wrong time. Getting shot hasn't swayed to Polly's stance on the current crime wave, an increase he says criminologists predicted. We have unprecedented events taking place right now and over the past couple of years. Had the Black Lives Matter police accountability movement, plus we've had the pandemic and the end of social distancing coming together. Those are two things we've never dealt with before, much less at the same time. Topali, who studies crime trends, anticipates crime could drop in the fall, but the Buckhead City Committee has no plans to wait. The group cites neighboring Sandy Springs and Brookhaven as examples of controlling their own tax dollars. Both also control their own police departments, yet none are immune to crime. To compare, we looked at crime rates per 100,000 people. Violent crimes increased in Sandy Springs after cityhood in 2007. Brookhaven faced a similar situation after 2013. In breaking down the number of murders, rapes, robberies and assaults, we noticed crime trends in newly formed cities often mirror Atlanta while experts question cityhood as a strategy for curbing crime. So many things account for why you have crime at any given time, in particular types of crime. Even if you created a new city and you saw that crime was going down, I bet you would also see that crime was going down in other areas not very far from that particular new city. The Atlanta Police Department put out a statement about the Buckhead cityhood movement. The department wrote in part, quote, regardless of where their enforcement activity occurs, it has an impact on crime throughout the entire city, Buckhead included. The Post also said the city is stronger when everyone works together. For more on these investigations or to submit a tip to the Reveal team, text REVEAL to 404-873-9114 or email us at thereveal at 11alive.com. My name is Robert Stovall. I was freed from jail because of an 11 Alive investigation. 
if we didn't call the judge, where do you think you'd be? Still in there, definitely. This story, um, this journalism, it made me feel like there's a sense of human compassion left in the world still and that we have an opportunity to get some of the things back that we've lost. I never thought that the news could be so important. Thank you for watching The Reveal. You can stream all of our shows on our 11 Alive YouTube channel, and we'll see you next time on The Reveal.